Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Jew from the North, and uh, we are joined by Dr. Ken Rogers um, to discuss what does Canada think of the attack on Israel. Good morning, Ken. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, um, you know, this is, um, you know, as, as previous wars between Israel and Hamas and other terrorist organizations, have gone. This is largely a matter of media. It's largely, um, and it's uh, who who wins uh, the hearts and minds of people, and um, and certainly that's the case here. And this morning, just a, an hour or two ago, um, another inflection point developed, and that is an explosion in a hospital in in uh, Gaza, where the uh, Arabs say that five hundred people were killed. And the Israelis say that it was an errant rocket uh, sent up uh, to go to to go into Israel by Islamic Jihad, and it failed. And it came down on the hospital. Um, but um, you know, at the same time, um, you know, the uh, Hamas people and for that matter, the Islamic Jihad people and all the Palestinians are saying, no, 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 this had to be Israel. So you have a, uh, a factual issue. The Israeli Times came out with a number of uh, data uh, reflections and videos showing uh, what happened, that the rocket was sent up from Gaza, and went up into the sky, it failed, it came down on the hospital. But by that time, um, half the world, if not more, had condemned Israel. So you have a public relations crisis again. I'm so sad about this because uh, it really does tie the hands of the Israelis until it's sorted out. Your thoughts about all that, Ken? Well, I think before the hospital uh, exploded, it was pretty clear that um, the, the sentiment here in Canada, and obviously, you know, from the Biden administration, was that, uh, you know, the um, crisis for the individuals in uh, in the uh, Gaza Strip was really the crucial issue t to be solved. You know, that Israeli the Israelis should. Um, uh, stand on their head to, you know, accommodate problems for the civilians in the Gaza Strip. Um, the hospital explosion just exaggerated that problem to where, you know, the Israelis, you know, to most Arab nations look like they're committing genocide against the Palestinians. Uh, you know, and a lot of these nations, um, you know, were ones that uh, when Russia bombed uh, hospitals and and uh, elementary schools in Ukraine, you know, they didn't think anything of it, um, you know, and uh, actually voted against resolutions to condemn uh, Russia in the General Assembly of the United Nations. So that um, I think it's... Um, not just a propaganda war, as you described it, but here in Canada, the you know the underlying um, attitude is still that uh, you know the Hamas is a terrorist organization. They started this mess, and uh, secondly, um, no one living in the um, uh, West Bank or in Gaza are really complicit to what, uh, you know, the existence of Hamas, Hamas, the support from Iran, and the fact that the, the you know, terrible mess occurred last Saturday, uh, you know, they caused their terrorist attack. They are terrorists. They've been supported by uh, the people of the West Bank. And so, you know, it's um, just a very unfortunate, uh, you know, extension of the problem of the, uh, you know, the plight of the Palestinian refugee or the 
Palestinian people living in the um, Gaza Strip. I mean, I was surprised in, in uh, looking at some of the statistics that 80% of the people in the uh, Gaza Strip were already on on international welfare. You know, so, you know, when you're sitting where you got two and 2.3 million people that are incapable of looking after themselves, you know, where you've got you know, the immediate neighbor, the Israelis, uh, you know, are thriving. They're one of the, you know, highest standards of living in the world. And and certainly they, you know, contribute greatly to the world at large, where the Palestinians uh, are just, uh, uh, you know, a drain. I saw a piece on um, cable last night. This is very interesting. This guy named uh, Brenner. Brenner has been around for a long time in international relations and uh, advising, you know, pol policy and uh, diplomatic policy and the like. And he said that when Gaza was turned over um, to the Palestinians, um, it, they were given a lot of money at the same time. And they have been given a lot of money um, by the West. Um, you know, it's it's another thing when uh, Iran gives them money because Iran gives them money so they can, you know, attack Israel. That's Iran's program. But in the, in the initial phase, and maybe for years after, they were given a lot of money by the West in hopes that they would develop that standard of living you were talking about. And uh, you know, the the very um, um, the very interesting notion that he put out there was that people thought that Gaza would be, and I quote, the Singapore of the Mediterranean, that the uh, the Palestinians could develop their own state and they could um, make it uh, make it bloom, sort of like the way the Israelis made the desert bloom in the rest of Israel. Um, but they haven't done that. They spent the money on terror. Um, and, you know, you, you can never forget that. What a tremendous squander over decades. They could have had the Singapore of the Mediterranean. I think his name is Ian Brenner. Um, very knowledgeable guy. Anyway, the, the bottom line is that, um, you know, it's, it's really a substandard place to live. And uh, it, all the uh, oxygen has been drawn out, drawn off by terrorist groups who don't really care. Uh, Golder Meir said that uh, we'll have peace um, with the Arabs when they love their children more than they hate Israel, um, and and that's and that's a statement of the focus of this community. They hate Israel, and their children hate Israel more than they love their children. She said that many years ago, and it's still true today. So you really wonder what happened with that hospital explosion. I mean, there are three logical possibilities. One is the Israeli dropped the bomb early this morning. I mean, our time. Um, the second is that that, that, uh, one, that that one just doesn't make sense to me. I mean, that's what the press here was saying initially. Uh, I haven't, uh, you know, seen the press in the last hour or so, but uh, certainly, you know, that seemed to be, you know. The case, but it just doesn't make sense that they would do that, especially after uh, Tony Blinken had negotiated with uh, Netanyahu, Netanyahu that uh, you know they would have uh, corridors for the Palestinian refugees. They would allow in aid, and clearly they were delay going to delay their ground attack uh, while they could set this up. Yeah. So I mean, then, that, that, you, you, I interrupted you, and you had your other two two logical happenings of what might have occurred to the uh, hospital. Well, yeah, that that one uh, is uh, you know really troubling because the Israelis wouldn't do that, and they do have precision bombing uh, technology where they know what they're bombing. That's why they go and they bomb buildings where they believe that Hamas is is there, um, and I don't think. Um, 
I mean, I think they know where they bombed. And if they tell you they didn't bomb there, you, you would believe them. I would believe them. Anyway, so one possibility is the Israelis bombed and it would have to be intentionally bombed, um, you know, this, this hospital. The second possibility is that, um, and this is an awful possibility, but it's in line with what Golda Meir said many years ago, um, that, uh, that the, that, that the um, Hamas bombed the building because they wanted to have a moral advantage. They wanted to make the uh, Israelis uh, look like monsters. Um, and uh, I, that's just not likely that they would do that, but it's a, a logical possibility. And the third possibility is that the uh, Israeli statement is correct. And if you look at, at uh, the, you know, the news that comes out on Google, you will see, oh, condemnations hither and yon all over the place. And Arab countries that were willing, willing to uh, welcome uh, Joe Biden and, and Tony Blinken are no longer willing, and they terminated all these meetings and what have you. Um, but, and that's the propaganda machine you talked about. Um, but the Israeli papers and the Israeli military has actually um, published videos and data showing the arc of this particular rocket. The rocket comes up from inside uh, Gaza, it goes high into the sky, and then something goes wrong. And it comes down, straight down. And it comes down on top of the hospital. It was a failed rocket, the Israelis say, from Islamic Jihad, which is a companion organization with Hamas, and it blew up the hospital. And you can see pictures of it. But you know, in the propaganda war, the non-kinetic propaganda war, where it's all about media and social media, the media has latched on to the you know the notion that it must have been the Israelis, uh, and they don't want to hear about um, you know the, the the technical data and the videos that the Israelis have published on this. So right now, you know, it's in contention, and um, the world is in contention, and, and there are, there's information and disinformation. At the end of the day, it's it's chaos. So as far as I'm concerned, this is an informational chaos right now. It doesn't serve the Israelis very well, though, because the immediate gut reaction, as um, you know, as promulgated um, by Hamas and its friends, immediately after the explosion, immediately after, was um, you know all this um, damage and destruction, and it was all the Israelis' fault. So this kind of somehow it changes things. Um, because, you know, in fact, public opinion does change things and propaganda does change things. And now we have um, a kind of, um, you know, more chaos. Only this time it's in, in the world of propaganda. I'm so sad about this because I don't understand why the Israelis haven't gone in yet. You know, there's all these uh, statements that they they were going in and they were you know, having special patrols and trying to root out the Hamas in the northern part of Gaza. But we haven't we haven't heard much more than that. And we haven't heard any other reason, I mean, any other legitimate, believable reason why they haven't uh, gone in with their land war yet. And I believe that that could be a geopolitical thing. It could be that the United States is suggesting, as Biden did on 60 Minutes on Sunday, that it wouldn't be a good idea. Uh, what he said was it wouldn't be a good idea for them to occupy Gaza. I'm not sure what that means in terms of invading Gaza. Maybe there's a differentiation there. In any event, this is going to last a long time. It's going to be a war of attrition. And I'm sad because there are um, you know, 360,000 Israeli troops waiting. And they're not at their jobs. You know, they're all, most of them are civilian. Um, civilians and their reservists. And so when you see them waiting at the Gaza border, they're not working. The Israeli economy is probably ground to a halt. Uh, and a war of attrition would you know, continue that and make it very difficult for the economy. Yeah? Well, I tend to think that the Israelis um, did not do their invasion because of the United States interference in the United States push that um, the plight of the Palestinian civilians was too great. You know, that is, the U.S. was pushing, you've got to 
you know, cutting off the power, uh, the food supply, water, etc., uh, was having too much damage, you know, publicity-wise or just because the U.S., like Canada, would believe that that's just not humane enough. You know, that didn't, you know, just because um, Russia can bomb uh, the Ukraine and think nothing of it, uh, those of us with a, with a conscience uh, shouldn't do that type of thing. You know, that the rules of war uh, should apply. The good guys should behave and the bad guys are going to do their rotten things anyhow. Uh, so that I think that the delay in the um, invasion was really to allow uh, some kind of humanitarian uh, relief, you know, to, you know, try to change the general press that, that you know, uh, the Israelis weren't there just for revenge, no matter how ugly the tactics are, no matter who was in the way, you know, as if every single child or or woman or other civilian in in the uh, Gaza Strip was um, was a Hamas member. Hmm. You know, we can never forget there are still two hundred plus. Um, hostages uh, in in Gaza held by Hamas and not a one of them not a one let me repeat that not a one of them has been released um and you know don't you think that if they released those hostages the need for Israeli ground war would be severely reduced it would be necessary arguably although Israel said it wants to you know terminate uh, Hamas but it would take the heat off for sure if they released hostages. They haven't released a single one. All they do is show you these videos of people running for ambulances uh, and suffering in hospital car. And it's that, frankly, I, I really wonder why the cameras are always there. The cameras are always there to catch these people who are wounded. Uh, it's almost like they're making a movie for world consumption. Um, the other aspect is, uh, and this is shades of the 1948, uh, you know, uh, War of Independence uh, uh, in Israel. Um, so here are all these Arabs, um, Palestinians, bunched up um, on, on the southern border with Egypt. And Egypt is not providing food or water or fuel or shelter. Egypt is not letting them cross the border. Um, probably, my guess, is because Egypt is enjoying a period of prosperity over tourism. A lot of people are going to see the pyramids for some reason these days. And if you allow um, a million uh, Palestinians into Egypt, A, you're going to have to take care of them. That's an expensive business. And B, you don't know which, which ones of them are Hamas and are going to do terrorism in Egypt, um, connected with the Muslim Brotherhood and all that. And so, you know, there's a real risk for Egypt, and Egypt isn't taking any risks. And then you have all the other Arab countries around there that, you know, condemn Israel and swear, you know, uh, a loyalty to the Palestinians. None of them are providing food, water, shelter, fuel. None of them are taking any of the of the Palestinians who are bunched up at the Israeli border. None of them. Did I mention none of them? Not a one of them. So well, uh, you know, this I, is a, I'd, I'd say um, I might put an exception in there for Jordan, because Jordan is is loaded with Palestinian refugees from years ago. You know, and and their economy has suffered because they're not good performing citizens like immigrants that come into Canada. They're just there, you know, blood sucking the economy as far as I could see. Um, but the your point is, you know, dead on that uh, none of these Arab countries, even Iran, that's sponsoring the terrorism, uh, want any of these Palestinians. 
you yeah. Know, there's nobody saying we'll we'll you know why not uh, allow us to bring you know ships to the Mediterranean or or let us use an airport and we'll fly them all out to you know these poor people. They're just saying these poor people, but they, they got don't let them come our way. Um, yeah, they want them to suffer. They want them to suffer so that the world will condemn Israel as responsible for their suffering. But none of those countries, uh, maybe Jordan is an exception in some way, but, you know, Jordan also terminated its meeting uh, with uh, Biden uh, or Anthony Blinken over this, what happened today. So I'm not sure how friendly Jordan is in the long term. Um, but but here we go. You know, as all these people are not giving the Israelis any support. I'm sorry. All these people who are condemning the Israelis, not giving the Palestinians any support, they would like to see this go on and on. They would like to see those videos of the poor Palestinians suffering, suffering, um, and, and that will exacerbate the situation and, and make it worse. Um, so you know, that's what I get. And, I, and, and so uh, although I don't really think that Hamas blew the hospital up itself, um, I, I, think, I think it's what the Israelis say and what they have shown proof of is that it was an errant missile bound for Israel, maybe Tel Aviv, uh, that fell short. It shot right up, and you can see it coming right down, right on top of the hospital. But the world doesn't accept that. They, don't, they, they have a problem with, with truth. Um, and I think it, it's like what's happening in this country, a problem with truth. So my question to you, Ken, is what is, I know it's too early for you to say what, what, what the feeling is in Canada among the people of the government and so forth. But up till now, what has the feeling been in Canada? Well, the feeling was very much like, like the U.S., you know, that um, the attack against Israel was very barbaric, uh, you know, calling them terrorists was definitely the correct thing to do. Uh, very strong um, sympathy towards Israel, uh, uh, very much the feeling that uh, Israel is like us, uh, you know, in the sense of civilized place that uh, tries to do good things for its people and, and those that it deals with uh, uh, in most business cases, and that they were trying hard to expand um, good relations. You know, they've been you know, with the U.S.'s help, trying to set up, uh, you know, better relations with the United Arab Republic and, and Saudi Arabia and, and other neighbors. Um, you know, Iran and their friends being the exceptions. But um, really, uh, you know, it, it's kind of the the one piece that I found interesting in discussions I've had in the last few days with Canadians was, what do you think would happen with the, um, the prisoners? You know, the what they let's call it the not prisoners, but rather the um, hostages. hostages. Okay, and you really had um, you know a split feeling like. Uh, I had um, about half the people I, I talked to said there's zero chance the hostages are going to be alive. You know, that that the minute it was clear that Israel was going to do a premeditated, uh, you know, invasion of the uh, Gaza uh, and in particular where they wanted to separate the North End and Gaza City which is where, you know, my understanding of it is where most of Hamas's underground operations are, uh, that, uh, you know, the uh, typical member of Hamas, uh, how, what are they going to do? You know, unless they're all suicide bombers and don't care, you know, in which case the hostages are dead anyhow. But can you envisage, you know, the Israelis uh, having invaded um, the northern half of the Gaza Strip, uh, even though they told everybody, including those in the hospital, 
that uh, they should uh, evacuate the northern end because they wanted to do a, a search and find mission, uh, search and find uh, a where the you know if the hostages are there still, and uh, but also where all of the Ham Hamas um, uh, rocketry is stored uh, their underground facilities and blow them up. You know, but if you eventually get some Hamas terrorist standing there with his uh, Israeli captive, you know, what are his choices? You know, if he, uh, you know, he can't trade the captive for his own life, you know, because if he gives up the cap uh, the hostage, he'll be dead anyhow. You know, you know, Israel certainly wouldn't say, we'll let you go to Iran if you give us the hostage. You know, that might work. But then, you, try, you know, they, uh, that just seemed unlikely to everybody I talked to. They just seemed to think that there was no way that uh, that any of those hostages would live unless it was a, a fantastic uh, uh, recovery met, um System somewhat like was done at that uh, airport in uh, in Africa many years ago. In mm. Tebi, I think was the name. And Tebi, yeah, yeah. And let, I mean, and that, that kind of rescue operation just doesn't make any sense in Gaza because all the tunnels and that sort of thing. Mm. You know, it's if if these people have demonstrated, they use um, civilians, Palestinians women, children, whatnot, as human shields. And they've been doing that for a long time. You know, this is not the first Gaza war where that strategy has been revealed. Um, so the, the kind of people, Hamas, terrorists, who use women and children and civilians as human shields, and, you know, do you think for a minute uh, that they see value uh, in preserving the lives of of the um, Israeli hostages, no, they would use them as shields. They would use them as a kind of artifact uh, to make um, people worry. And indeed, you know, Israelis who are related to them, families, friends, what have you, Americans that are related are are beside themselves about the suffering that these people are doing. Um, there was a some report that um, a number of them were tortured before they were taken away. A number of them were tortured before they were killed. Um, so it's not likely they're having a reasonable existence. Mind also that the, the footage that came out of some of those people held by Hamas before they were, well, before or after they were removed to Gaza, were wounded and bleeding. Do you really think they received medical care? I, I, think, I think we have to write them off. Uh, it's so sad that their families in, in you know in Israel and in the U.S. and and elsewhere believe and wish and hope and pray that they'll be returned safely. But the ch as you say, Ken, the chances of that are not very great. They're objects, and, and the um, the Hamas is only going to use them, and such as the video of a, a young woman that was revealed uh, that was published by Hamas yesterday. Um, where she was being forced to say this, that, the other thing. And, and um, they want to give you proof of life, okay, for one out of 200 plus. So you should be even more concerned. Um, but as to how many others are alive, that's really anybody's guess. Doubtful that all of them are. Doubtful that even a high percentage of them are. So <clears throat> suffice to say, these people are inhuman. If they're inhuman in killing Israel, Israelis at the southern end of uh, Israel uh, near the Gaza border, they're inhuman at treating those same people within Gaza as hostages. And I, I think we have to, you know, write that into our calculus of what is going to happen here. On the well, other hand, on the other hand, I think the uh, they made one very interesting move. They said at some point. When you know the the when things are right, I don't know what that means. Um, they will separate. This is out of the Nazi era. They will separate 
uh, a, a separation process of separating the Israelis from the non-Israelis among the hostages, and they will release the non-Israelis. And this is a way, obviously, um, to um, separate uh, the countries that are supporting Israel and Israel. If those countries get their hostages back, um, it's a different program. And um, that's that's also very clever, very tricky, and and very inhumane. Well, one of the things with the hostages was the um, a few years ago where the um, Hamas had one Israeli uh, soldier, I think he was, but they traded that one soldier for one thousand. Hamas uh, or Palestinian prisoners, you know, so they certainly with um, good reason believe that every single hostage is of great value. Well, the guy who's running Hamas right now was an Israeli uh, prisoner um, in jail as a terrorist, and he was released, possibly in that group of a thousand people. Uh, that they released in exchange for the one Israeli soldier. By the way, it took five years to conclude those negotiations, just for reference. And and so, I mean, it's it's, it's dangerous business. There are something in the order of seven thousand um, militants and um, um, you know uh, uh, terrorists in Israeli jails right now. Um, and uh, that's what Hamas wants. He wants them all back, all of them. So we're in a, a bit of a, a problem here because there's a multi-front war going on, and Hezbollah and uh, Iran are busy at the northern frontier in Lebanon, and Lebanon is not being helpful about this. So the Israelis have, you know, a lot of trouble on their hands, and they need they need help from the U.S. Um, and this does not help, and I am concerned that this will undermine the relationship between Israel and Biden and, and Biden's ardor about helping Israel. I hope he understands that this was not the Israelis did this. I hope he understands that the data and the video that has been published by Israel is, is the correct statement. But let me ask you this. I mean, the, it's the media. One last question, Ken. The media, uh, very troubling. I look at all kinds of media, and I find that uh, it's hard to put a percentage on it, but a huge percentage is all about the sad story of the Palestinians. And a very small percentage now, 10 days later, 11 days later, a very small percentage is about the uh, the genocide and the brutality uh, affected on the, on the Israelis in those in those communities near near Gaza. And I and I feel that the media is just going for the raw meat. The media is not giving us the real story here. The media is just showing us how, how the Palestinians are, um, uh, you know, parading themselves around. What do you think? Uh, I think you're correct in the sense that, um, you know, the Palestinian press or whatever you have have been able to release release enough videos of, of suffering of uh, of the um, citizens of uh, the Gaza Strip, that they've got the sympathy of of all the press in the world, really. Uh, and you know, the general drift as time has gone on is um, uh, the kind of you know fiery speech that uh, you know the you know head of Israel gave about. Uh, you know, revenge, 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 revenge. Um, you know, and, and revenge is not a nice human quality. You know, and and it was like the Israelis were too vicious, too aggressive, too, you know, uncaring in terms of their relentless bombing, etc. And and the uh, press from within the Gaza Strip, uh, you know, being good enough and that they've been able to get out to the public and the rest of the world, all, every single scene that they could find of, uh, of children bleeding <laughs> equivalent uh, to, you know, keep that image um, 
of Israelis or Israel's going way too far. They're very unreasonable. You know, basically, two wrongs do not make a right. Yeah, you know, I, they, I've always felt that it, the Israelis are not really all that good at public relations. They're not really all that good at making the world understand their position and their concern. One of the things that Golda Meir said years ago was, uh, you know, the secret weapon of the Israelis in dealing with the, the attacks that periodically are made against Israel is, 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 is summarized in one phrase, no alternative. There's no way they can go. And um, that, that really tells you everything. And that's where it is now. Uh, so I am worried about the future of the state of Israel and everybody in it, um, because I think that public opinion plays an important role. And and the what do you want to call it? The uh, Palestinian community, including in, on the campuses of this country and your country, um, are, are playing it out against Israel. Israel is not responding in a way I would respond, or you would respond in terms of managing, you know, the uh, the media. In the, next can, few, oh, in the next few days, do you expect uh, uh, Hezbollah or, you know, troops from Syria, etc., cetera, to um, uh, open another front? Or do you figure they'll figure that Israel, Israel's hurting enough from the uh, press that uh, they will stop pounding Gaza? That's an interesting question. Uh, the answer can be pretty scary. Uh, we should continue our discussion because this is this is going to unfold uh, between now and the time we meet again, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> it it definitely isn't going to get much better. <laughs> no, it isn't. Well, thank you, no, Ken. But uh, and and I certainly pray for the hostages, but I don't think they have, have much chance. Same here. And Dr. Ken Rogers in uh, Kelowna, British Columbia, thank you for joining us on The View from the North here at Think Tech. Hello. Uh, hello. <laughs>